Wild roses are very tough. We imagine DiCaprio in The Revenant. He's like really hardy. He's like able to take all that snow. Have you ever wondered why some roses have a simple open structure? And others have a tight rosette appearance. Let's dig deeper. Let's dig deeper. <laughs> So Dave, we're talking about roses. It can't get better than this, can it? Charles and I are here to talk about roses in all their forms. So Dave, for our viewers out there, should we just explain what the difference between wild and cultivated roses are? Cultivar basically is the abbreviation of cultivated variety. So if you imagine tigers and lions and they exist naturally in the wild, whereas if you look at a tabby cat, for example. That's something that's been cultivated and bred. And so if you look at the wild roses, you can compare that to the lions and the tigers. And if you look at the cultivated or the cultivar roses, those are the ones which have been selected from the wild and bred and bred and bred and bred and bred until you, know, you produce something completely different. You know, wild roses, they evolved around 35 million years ago and this is a time when the Antarctic sheets were first forming but also the Himalayas were still relatively young and as the mountains went up had a, a period of diversification uh, with all these changes in habitats. Um, really tough habitats, cold, you know, dry, stuff changing very very quickly so they had to adapt very quickly. So. Because of this, wild roses oftentimes are very tough, they're very resilient. And what we have here is a single rose flower. It's a regular symmetrical flower with five petals and numerous stamens in the centre. And these are the characteristics of a wild rose flower. What they don't have in, you know, ornamental features in terms of more petals, more scent, they have in being able to survive. Roses have been grown since ancient times. They were probably seen growing in the wild and people brought them into towns and villages and gardens oh, yeah. because they liked the scents or they found them attractive. And there were around half a dozen of these old roses that were very popular to be grown. And then around the 18th century, the China rose came to Europe. And this was the first repeat flowering rose that Europeans had seen. And this kind of blew the minds of Europeans. Yeah, why would it be? Um, <laughs> and that's when the explosion of modern rose breeding started. And so, and this is what defines the, when we talk about old roses and modern roses. The modern yeah. roses are, are the post-China rose from the, eight, the 18th century. So now let's look at the structure of a rose. At the top here, you've got the petals. In this one, Rosa chinensis, the Chinese rose, it's got quite a lot of petals. So some of its parts have been modified from its reproductive organs um, into petals. The reproductive organs, the male stamens and the female starlin stigma are encased within this. Outside of the petals, you have an area called the calyx, which is the collective term for the sepals, which are these little protrusions, some of which can be toothed, semi-toothed. And behind that, you have a receptacle, which is kind of like the cup which holds the flower. And attached to the receptacle, you have a pedestal, so the stem of the flower. And along this pedestal, we also have two leaf protrusions, which we call bracts. Thorns in roses are a bit of a funny one because botanically, the protrusions on the stem of roses are actually prickles. And prickles are extensions of the epidermis or the outer skin layer of the plant. The Rosa chilensis is a particularly interesting wild rose in that it's got a closed shape. And, you know, whilst you don't see any reproductive parts here, I can do a bit of a reveal. And if I gently prise off, 
to the petals, you'll see the male stamens. At the end of each of these filaments, you'll find anthers. And on top of these anthers, you'll find pollen. Let's have a chat about the structure. Um, what do you think the main differences are between roses? Basically, it's the number of petals and stamens that are exposed, the reproductive parts of the flower. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, some of the wild roses, you'll have a reduced amount of petals in, com in comparison to the cultivated roses. So you can see here, um, Rosa palustris, oops, we lost the petal there, usually has five petals, whereas um, something like... This is Princess Anne. Princess Anne uh, has a lot more. And that's basically the stamens have modified to become petals. So that mass of stamens that a pollinator will be attracted to to visit have been modified into these petal-like structures and there's virtually no reproductive parts left in the flower at all. The pollinator, I mean, they can't even get into the flower. It, that mass of petals is yeah. a complete obstruction to a hover, hoverfly or a bee mm. trying to pollinate. With wild roses, pollinators are the main method of transferring genetic um, information and producing new um, babies or progeny. How do you do it with cultivated roses? Well, unfortunately, the pollinators are unable to pollinate a, a modern cultivar rose flower. Um, these are produced um, artificially from cuttings and grafting. So it's also important, Dave, isn't it, to, for, for humans to intervene in the propagation of cultivated cultivar roses. The only way they'll survive into the future is, is by human propagation. Yeah. So rose hips are the swollen receptacle. You know, botanists like to have all this special terminology but it is essentially the fruit of the rose. But there's also this distinction that botanists make um, of what the fruit actually is. So upholding the fruit usually on a plant uh, is a receptacle, a holder, a gobbler, a, a cup. Um, so if you imagine you've got a cup and then inside it you have all sorts of treasure and luxuries. That is, inside the cup is what usually is the fruit in a plant, but in this case, in the case with all rose family plants, the fruit is the enlarged cup, so the receptacle, as botanists call it. Within the receptacles you'll have individual fruits. You know, the rose is so prevalent in our society. The importance in culture and symbolism in human history. Symbolism of love, of friendship, of not love, depending on what colour it is. <laughs> and it's been pervasive throughout some of the ancient sort of recorded civilizations which we grew up learning about. And there's stories about roses going back to the ancient Greeks. You know, aside from the Greeks, the Romans also used roses as symbolism. The symbolism for secrecy, for confidentiality. Um, the term sub rosa meaning in private. And the Romans used to hang roses from the ceilings of places they gather where they would drink wine. And that was, a sim that was symbolic of saying, well, you know, whatever happens or whatever you say under the roses stays under the roses. There's something a lot closer to home uh, that influences us in modern society here in the UK. And that is the Victorians. The Victorians Can talking. you tell me a bit more about Victorians? They, Victorians put significance, emotional significance, on different roses um, in something called floriography. And so floriography was a system of conveying different sentiments and so in floriography, to give someone a red rose right. would essentially be saying, I love you. Yeah. Um, to give someone a white rose would be a, a, the opposite, a rebuttal. Okay. I wouldn't like to receive a white rose. That would be <laughs> heartbreaking, wouldn't it? 
Gosh. Apart from that, in the modern day, the rose still is pervasive throughout our society today. Like in the trans community, it is the symbol for the trans day of remembrance. So Charles, we have many cultivated roses in our gardens that are thriving, but how are wild roses doing in the natural habitats? Are, they, are there issues with their conservation? Yeah, I think, you know, at the moment, the world is going through what they call the sixth mass extinction. And plants from all around the world are really struggling, going extinct at, you know, increasing rates. And that's not different for the wild rose. Um, Q, at Q, we do a lot of work across the world to collect and conserve um, plants, including roses. I also know that, for example, some of the old cultivated roses, for example, you know, in the UK, roses have been bred for hundreds, if not, you know, a thousand years. Some of the older varieties are also going, disappearing from cultivation. Um, is there anything to, to help them save Well, them? many roses have fallen out of cultivation, have been forgotten. Many of the old roses particularly would have disappeared if it hadn't been for a very few collectors around the middle of the 20th century who maintained um, collections of the old rose cultivars. And actually there's a big scheme in the UK um, where people hold national collections and that's um, organised by a organisation called NCCPG for people to enjoy on going into the future. Thanks for watching this episode of Dig Deeper. If you like this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to learn more about the work that Q does, visit our website for more information.